Recording is on. All right, so today's uh, January 17th, uh, 2021. We're continuing our discussion on the Desiderata extinction nadi. And based on the notes, um, are we? did you want to continue from last week? Um, or do we want to touch on the uh, the book on tyranny? Um, well, let's go. Yeah, I, I thought we could just leave it up to see what events happened this week. So maybe we should just round, uh, just make sure anybody has any news or anything about what they found. The only thing I mean, I've been hoping a lot. <laughs> on what I've yeah. found. I read the book. Um, Very good. I read the book. Um, it's brilliant. Oh yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, audio book um, yeah the king I, of, uh, yeah but it's, it's not very long and it says it all it's a very good book you didn't learn anything out of it yeah, but it, okay. it's a good book to share you know um but yeah it was um, just I, I think uh i posted on the discord the man from virginia who came to the um washington and he was caught having a handgun and 500 on ammunition um, but then he was let go but he still has to go on his ar a trial arraignment and um he and i had a conversation he thought he was just a um, a contractor he, he thought he was just a private contractor uh, it's hard to tell there's not enough information i mean you know that yeah. he could be recce just you know testing but yeah um it seems very very quiet it seems, I think, uh, if we get through today and tomorrow, then I'll be greatly relieved. <laughs> I think, I think yeah. leaving it to the inauguration day, a coup, leaving it to the last day, a coup doesn't sound realistic. But I think, um, yeah, I was uh, I was looking at, I saw this thing from the BBC. These guys are not so dumb as they seem. They, they figured out that it was a, you know, a trap. The authorities were setting a big trap and they figured out, you know, basically Trump is using them for, you know, an excuse. So not as, as dumb as they seem. <laughs> but I, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, I'm not going to relax until the 21st because the, I think the bar is pretty low for, for Trump. All he needs to do is to get um, enough unrest to call it an insurrection which is pretty easy. I mean, I think, you know, this it's the state capitals. I mean, all 50 state capitals, particularly ones like Minneapolis and things like that are, are very vulnerable. The ones in the South are vulnerable. You only have to have two or three of those and you've got enough movie footage to say, you know, for him to declare, um, you know, invoke the Insurrection Act. It's been, it's been invoked before. And so it's um, it wouldn't be unprecedented. It's a pretty low bar to do it. So, yeah, I think he would definitely take the, the excuse if he's given it. So it's pretty smart if those guys are smart enough not to do anything. <laughs> but um, yeah, I didn't think they were that smart, but apparently they are. What do other people think? I think some people have, have figured it out like you. Um, I think that a lot of people are smart enough to not fall into the trap because as you posted on, on Reddit, the, the research for martial law and insurrection went skyrocketing. And I think it's been debated in a lot of, lot of forums, this possibility of martial law. And I think some people have read into the, the scenario. The mind of a psychopath is quite easy to read for a sane person. Um, you know, it's kind of predictable. And, um, I think that's what people have done. I don't know. Um, Oh, yeah, it's yes. predictable if you're prepared to be conspiratorial. What, what uh, you know, unsettles me is that the fact that the left will not see conspiracies. So if, if you like, if, you, if you're incapable of seeing evil, you're going to be a victim of it. And if you won't see evil, I think that you deserve what you're going to get. But yeah. I think it's, it's um, you know, the, the left thing, oh, conspiracy theories will, will be okay, we'll block our ears. And it's like, no, it's the other way around. You're, you, you're far better off you know, having false positives than false negatives. One false negative on a conspiracy like this, and you, you're toast for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, but 
the normalcy bias and it's like oh don't don't unnerve me don't uh, don't uh, you know upset my equilibrium mm. is really what they're saying so it means that they it's the same story over and over the, the liberals care more about their feelings about than about their liberty yeah, yeah just, just on that point unless anybody's got anything else to say it's just like yes yeah, i kind of want to raise the point about what's the difference between um, anarchists and and these guys it's it's they're very very close if you see some of the things that they say i mean the trump and trump support well trump's are just out for himself <laughs> he's just a psychopath but what he's leaning on is libertarian sentiment and so these right-wing libertarians they're very close to anarchists in a way um because they they hate the government and authoritarianism the difference between an anarchist and one of these right-wing libertarians is is uh, basically just heart. I mean, anarchists are people that have compassion and have a heart and sympathy um, and mutualism. And what these guys are, it's just pure ego. It's just basically their ego against the state. So they, they're fighting for your their ego. And I think anarchists are proper ones, not these fake ones. I'm appalled now on our anarchism to see these guys, how they're reacting. I mean, you go on our anarchism now at a time like this, it's appalling that they, they're posting stuff on, you know, how to do a fucking vegan garden and shit like that. <laughs> the whole world's about to blow up. And these, these I mean, they're, they're no revolutionaries. They're just, you know, liberals that like to wear black. That's all it is. They're just basically snowflakes in black. And so it's, there's no, anarchism is dead, but if you, if you, you know, the old ideal of true anarchists was, was egoless people that, you know, were, were against, you know, authoritarianism and for liberty. And uh, the, I think that the, 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 you know, basically all the right wing um, libertarians, they, they're sovereign individuals and they, they're fighting against the state for their ego. So it's the difference between fighting against the state without ego for liberty and for fighting for personal liberty against the state. There's, it's all a vast chasm. But I wish, um, I wish they would, I wish people would highlight that. Um, but, and anarchists just get beaten up from all sides. Now they're saying, they got that one guy who they said was an agent provocateur from Antifa. Now they're saying that, oh, the whole insurrection was, was Antifa. That's <laughs> like, oh my God. That's what they're reporting on the on the right, and you know it's it's getting getting headway. I watched OA, OAN and Fox News, and the, the digital divide between the libertarian the liber, you know the liberal media, the mainstream media with all these popular you know, hey look at these cute puppies uh, TV, and uh, the other the digital divide is so huge that they can't understand each other. It's like they're two different languages in the country. It's extraordinary. Yeah, and um, I also listened, uh, this week I also listened to some right-wing um, news, um, even Alex Jones, and yeah, it's the, a lot of the blame, they blame it on BLM, Antifa, and they even have a derogatory term for Antifa, they call them Pantifa, and it's like, there's, I don't know, people want to see them, you know, the right and the left come together, but at this point, I don't see it happening because they're just so far apart. So, so um, uh, it's like polarized. It, I don't see it coming together. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, there seems to be, well, it, I mean, I think the way I'd characterize it, there's a, a strong gender bias in all of this. It's getting blatantly, you know, like, oh, the girls have won. And you know, um, and from from the right wing, it's you know, it's the boys. <laughs> you know, it's like, hey, you're not going to castrate us, and you know, basically, emasculate us, and you know, take away our guns and stuff like that. It's it's a there's a strong kind of eroticism about it, and there's a strong gender bias about it, um, and no one talks about that, but it's. I mean, it's it's all over the place. If you even an XR and stuff, you know, they 
they're continually sniping, you know, you know a girl thing, a boy's thing, and stuff like that. And so it's, it is, a, it has all the characteristics of a huge gender war to me. What do other people think about that? I never thought of that. I, I don't know. I, don't, I have no idea about that. I, it's funny that first time I think about it. Uh. Me neither. I've never thought of it as a gender war. I just know that the country is very polarized. And uh, as uh, Lord Hugh published, you know, one of the posts about um, an ARG where the right believes so much in something totally different. I mean, um, it's almost like we have we're living in different planets. Um, our truths are so different. Yeah, that, that's why I did the arg with Planet Elsewhere and Planet Nowhere <laughs> because it was literally a riff on the fact that we two we are on two different planets. Um, so it's a you know, I thought the ARG is supposed to be to wake people up almost through pantomime, really. Um, but you you can see how powerful an ARG is. Basically, what QAnon and these guys have done is, a, is an ARG. It's an alternate reality game. The alt-right is an alternative reality. And then the left shoots it down because they just say, well, it's, it's you know, silly conspiracy theories. But people people need them. I mean, Jung said that people need mythology. And we're suffering from the fact that no one has a mythology. Everybody, uh, you know, you have this scientific, hard, um, you know, rationalist view. And it's kind of absolutist. And then nobody weaves a story around it. Because you, you can weave, weave any story around it. But um, I think that the, the alt-right has woven a good story around it in, in terms of just conspiracy and distrust. It's taken, it's what a good shaman would do. It takes what everybody knows and thinks around the campfire and weaves a coherent, you know, story out of it so everybody can agree on some narrative. But it's, it's a pity that people won't do that anymore. There's this kind of um, absolutist idea that there is some truth out there that's reductionist and you can get to it and this you know scientists have a handle on it and you listen to authorities and stuff like that and it's like yeah but where's the mythology where are we going with all this i mean the world's getting dy dystopian and it's getting mechanized and wh what's the story here why are we doing all this it, it, it you know it's kind of this uh, insane blind doctor says kind of you know the world will be like this and there's no nobody's doing a story for why we're doing this and stuff and i think that's a big lack i think we need a mythology and and so what what i'm trying to do with an arg is to is to make a mythology that's a lot better than some you know QAnon conspiracy so i think people should be more forgiving or we should find a way of of engaging people in in some ways, it would it would almost be better if Trump won. If if Trump did have a coup, I mean, it would be freaking awful. But the the upside of it is that basically people would see the power of um, what Adam Curtis said was the power of nightmares. Basically, the power of just telling stories. And you know, the left should learn to tell stories. The left has increasingly cut off from the past. It's all this fucking cut, cut, cut. You know, it's, you know, cut off from everything, cut off from uh, history, cut off from, um, and ultimately it's a cut off from nature. They're, they're not too into nature anymore than the old right. Even the old right has a bit more, you know, kind of blood and soil and a bit more connected with nature, but it's, it's very much a National Geographic connection with nature, even on the left. So, you know, it's similar, you know, by the, it's uh, exemplified by the fact how we got to environmentalism has become something about green energy. You know, what the fuck's green energy? Green energy is just fucking industrialism by another name. I mean, isn't, isn't um, ecology something to do with nature and the wild? And it's like, no, no, we farm the wild, we hammer it, <laughs> cut it down to size, you know. But uh, it, yeah, I don't. I, I mean,
increasingly not liking the left. I don't, I don't like the left or the right, but I mean, I, I the, the the left's disgusting more and more. So it's just it's just the behavior now. I think that's uh, you know, left left is kind of always supposed to be an the anarchist side, and I just see it less and less. I <laughs> say, so how can these self obsessed egotists be anarchists? It's an outrage. Yeah, but that's that's what I think. What what do people yeah. think? Yeah, I uh, I kind of see that. Um, just being exposed to the left and the right, um, it, it sometimes it's good to step into their shoes or be amongst a crowd or or at least see them. And there's a different energy in the right. It seems like they're more. Um, they would they a lot of them have been saying that they die for their cause. They have a very strong emotion. Um, they won't let anything hold them back. And on the left, I see it as, let's be inclusive. Let's, uh, it's okay. We we shouldn't have a stance. Um, we should be uh, listen to everyone and come together. And then the rights, like this is my stand or, or the highway. It's like this is my way or the highway. And that's why a lot of people like Trump. He seems to be very authoritative, and he he likes to make deals. He says, and he. Supposedly he gets things done. He makes a he's a good showman, even though the facts don't show that he, you know, he's a good president. He he makes a good show and people see that. Hey, at least he's trying to make the country better. Oh, he wants to build up walls so these immigrants won't come or these terrorists, these uh, people from the south won't come in and with their drugs. So if they take a stand. And I mean, there's some elements the left can take from the right, right? Like to take a stand, to stand firm, um, have courage. Of course, don't uh, the ideals of the right, uh, I mean, there's some ideas that, that should be uh, that should be rejected, but of course, there's some ideas from the right that, that are worth considering. So that's what I think. Yeah. I it appeals to me personally that that the right takes um, is prepared to die for something. I I think that's kind of noble. I mean, they want to die for the wrong thing, but but it's kind of noble. I kind of admire that the fact that they do want to die for something. I mean, on the left, it seems like ask any liberal or anybody on the left. What would you die for? I was like, fuck all. I'd die for me. <laughs> I, I would. <laughs> they wouldn't. They wouldn't like you know get a hangnail for anything other than themselves or what their feelings or something like that. But that uh, you know, I. I mean, the idea of like dying to save the planet or dying to save you know the wild or what's left of the ecology of this planet. It's like there's no one. There's the very few people, there's like, you know, deep green resistance and stuff, but the average person wouldn't die for fucking anything. They would, they would, they would have, you know, they would have billions die in their stead, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't personally offer their lives for anything. And it's kind of nice that <laughs> kind of, it's a nationalistic ego they've got on the right. They would die for the, you know, some patriotic thing like that, but, um, but it still has kind of a bigger ego than just the individual ego. At least they a slightly bigger ego. At least it's, you know, their state or their nation or their party or <laughs> their white people or something. It's, at least it's bigger than themselves. It seems to me like the left is just like me. <laughs> it's like, what's this about? It's about me. <laughs> it's like, really? Is that the size of your ego? Yeah, it's a box. You know, this size, the size of your head. I'm sorry to contradict you, but I, I don't think there's a divide between left and right in that line. I think that in both sides, you've got people who are uh, into their ego completely, and you've got a little fringe on the right and as on the left of people who have um, come to terms with that um, who are connected to nature. I think... There, what we see of the right is only a, a little tiny, uh, you know, sample that's there. Uh, but in general, I, I talk to, to both, like you, Mike, and um, I, I, I see on both sides some people who are who are ready to die for something. Um, on both sides, but 
They're tiny. It's a fringe on both sides. I don't think you can just, I mean, the, the left makes me sick and the liberalism that has got to the left is, is the same as the, the liberalism that's gone to the right, except little nuances, you know, in, in terms of, but I, I don't see a difference. I see a big cent, extreme center and on these, on the side, some people who are still for liberty and who've got ideals, but it's, it's, there's no more divide. I, I don't think so. But it seems to me that the guys on the right, they say, you know, like our president or death and everybody goes, yay. And you say on the left, you know, anything or death and you'd be pelted with tomatoes from your own side. Yeah, yeah, but it's not, I don't, I don't know enough the, the American right to talk about it. I, I've only uh, experienced of the European right, so it's, it's probably a very different story um, across the Atlantic. Um, yeah, I'm really talking about America. Yeah, I've got my head totally in America now. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Uh, same here. Yeah, it just seems to me that's the moderation in the you know the it's the radical center again. It's the moderation is extreme. It's basically it's it's unhealthily moderate. You, you can't be that moderate. The only thing as moderate as that is a cow or a sheep or something that's going to get farmed. I, I think basically, you know, moderation taken to such an excess means that somebody's going to exploit it. And I think that's kind of what's happening. I mean, psychopaths push and push and see what they can get away with. And if, if you're a total, you know, herd animal, there's nothing that will stop it. They'll, they'll be chopping up your liver and dining on it if you don't uh, if you don't resist i think risa wants to talk yeah i have a, a comment to make i remember a number of years ago in new york city there was an election and one of the candidates that was running he wanted to make the subways free and i'm like no they're, they're people that work there they clean the subway they they work you know they work there where are they going to get their salary from they make it free so there's extreme on the left, there's extreme on the right, which is not good, so. But could, couldn't, I mean, the, the city pays their salary, right? It's, yeah. it's, not, it's not private corporation. Right, correct, correct. But they, they, made, they, was, they were making the, the person, the candidate was making a statement that the subway should be free in terms of the people that use the subways to get on, you know, to pay the fares and everything. But then where are they going to get the money for the people that work there? They, have, you know, they have to clean the subway. They have the people work there. I think they get them from taxes. Yeah, the, the problem, I, th I think, in most cities that have found that they gave free transport, they eventually had to start uh, charging at least, you know, peppercorn for transport because... What it exposes is if you if you make something free, it exposes all the problems uh, on the wider society. So if you make public transport free, then homeless people kind of you know sleep in the trains and stuff. So then to stop that, they have to. They always found you have to make at least ten cents or something like that to stop stop that because the reason why homeless people start sleeping on the trains is because they're not providing shelter, and so basically you. It, what it's a lesson in, and this is the problem with socialism in general, is you can't have little corners that are, are really socially just because basically they just get swamped by the other injustice. It's basically it's a little vacuum and all the structural violence and injustice and the rest of the system just bleeds into them. It's like why you can't have an anarchic community on an island somewhere because basically all the crooks and low lives and everything that are the, you know, generated by the capitalist system will come and use you as a base and so that you can't have your little islands you have to you basically it has to be socially just across the board and then nobody can get there because basically uh it's like where does the money come from <laughs> that's, the, the that's a, i think in essence is what you're saying isn't it Is like where does the money come from for socialism? Is ultimately what the challenge. What, that's the challenge here. Yeah, this is not Risa. This is A, um, and um, that's a very good point. I work 
in transit. And um, when COVID was at its peak, we stopped um, charging um, for uh, revenue so that passengers could get into the back door and not have to pay fare. And um, so I ride the bus to work. And um, yes, a lot of the people that remained riding were the unfortunate disadvantaged people. And you're very right because um, we live in a high, moderately high cost of living city. And um, there are not very many um, shelters for the homeless. So even before the pandemic, we would have um, riders who would just ride all, the, all day long because it's air conditioned in the summer and heated in the winter. And also the public libraries were the same way. Um, homeless people would fall asleep in chairs and the poor librarians would have to rouse them because they can stay as long as they don't sleep. So these poor people are slumping in chairs and the librarian, sir, you can't sleep here. So your point is very good that this little islands, if it's not fair across the board, um, all the resources of those uh, free um, services will be drained. Yeah, so the reason why socialism falls down is because then you need to collect the revenue to pay for all these social services. You basically, you can, you can, you can't really have a library like the, the Seattle Library. It's just you know kind of reeking. It's a wonderful library, but it's it you, it catches your breath to go in there because the the smell of homeless people is is so bad because people are li just living there because they got nowhere else to go and it's heated. And so basically, yeah, so it catches your breath just just going in there. It's kind of a trial, but then the. You can only have, it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you can only have a library. Once you've got people in food and shelter, you can't really operate, you know, part of the system or, you know, so, and so, so where you, you get to, I think, uh, is you say, well, the city has to pay for social services and for homeless people and for shelter and stuff like that. And it has to feed people that can't afford to feed themselves. And then the question is, where does that money come from? And I mean, it has to come from taxes. So then you have to have a state. And when you've got a state and taxes and you're collecting revenue, then you've got the system we've got now. So, so socialism doesn't get anywhere. The problem is you have to dismantle the whole system. I don't think industrialization works. It's simple, simply put, you, you can't have this system. Uh, you know, urban industrial society. It's civilization comes from civitas, a city. It is the social organization of a city. If you've got cities, you've got injustice and you, you will have capitalism. There's no escape. You can't sidestep it with socialism or communism. We, we, we just have to get rid of these urban jungles. If you, have cities, you, have, you have cities, you have pandemics, you have collapse. I was rereading against the grain for the second time through it, and every analysis of every city that started to rise in Mesopotamia fell from diseases. And it's just, I really think it's a, it's a must read that. It's the most recent book that James C. Scott wrote, and it's got it all. He's got it all in it. Uh, it's, it's, quite, it's not that big to read. And really, I think God is just, he's just, I can't, I can't summarize everything here, but uh, I think you've read it, Mike, haven't you? Uh, just portions of it, but I haven't finished it yet. Yeah. What, yeah. Uh, Against the Grain? Against the Grain, yeah. yeah. James C. Yeah, Scott. Yeah, I've read it. Yeah. Yes, it, I've read it. It's basically my thesis as well. It's that all those early cities, they they grew up um, and then burnt out. They, they like a bushfire, so that basically they consume all the natural environment that they can, and then they just move on exactly like a bushfire and it just gets bigger and bigger. And now we've got a bushfire, of, you know, one, it's the, the city is now as big as the globe. It's not a global village, it's a global city. So, so the, the, this is the final iteration of just, you know, moving on, just burning a scorched earth, scorching the natural environment in one thing and just moving on to wherever the resources are. So it's, it's, this utopian thing, we had a crossroads with all these um, millenarian utopianists who want to do this. 
this Promethean thing where they think, well, we all become androids. And uh, so the you know Rockefeller Foundation and the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution and all of those guys, they're saying, no, we, get, we can transcend nature and into this new wonderland where you know all the machines are taxed and we have a UBI and people can just sit around and it's like no it's not going to work you how long is it going to be before some little bean counter says you know what are all these useless drones who sit around these millions of people sitting around just collecting a UBI what are they for exactly and they'll be wiping us out in a genocide. You can't, it's, it's, the utopia is not going to work. It's socially, it's just one step closer to, you know, they, they don't respect the individual or people. And if, um, if there are loads of surplus people that are costing their precious system resources, they're going to be, uh, wipe us out. They, they're eugenicists at heart. And so, yeah, I, I, I think this, the most dangerous thing of all is this futuristic, um, um, Promethean futuristic future that's all positive about electronics and stuff like that. So you're not thinking this through. I, I posted this video that kind of, kind of said it now just 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 recently about uh, um, they, they basically said the same thing. They had um, Neural Harari, you know, the guy who did Sapiens and and all of that. They had him saying all the stuff um, that that I've been saying. But I don't think anybody hears this stuff. They just like the goodies. You know, they're so easily bought with shiny objects. And um, and people people like the, the, the urban environment. But what's dangerous about the urban environment is the intermediaries. It's basically you've got intermediaries be between you and everything you need. For so You've got intermediaries, lots of intermediaries between you and your food source and you and your justice and you and your protection and you and your health and you and nature they're, they're chains and chains of intermediaries and i think that uh, that's unsustainable you you can't have somebody intervening between you and you know if you're religious and you have a god you have a priest who's an intermediary between you and god any intermediary like that is um, is a false front and it's it's unsustainable so if you live in a city, you need intermediaries. You need people to bring food to you. You need uh, people to bring electricity and heat. And every damn thing you get has an intermediary. Then people say, well, all these big tech companies, they have us by the balls. And you say, like, uh, you're saying, like, well, we've got... Hello? <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought somebody said something. Uh, Children so, are in the background. Oh yeah, <laughs> so yeah, so basically, they, you know, you can't come to Amazon and say, "Hey, you've got us ball by the balls now because we're all at home and now you get food delivered." So then, um, you know, it's like you. Uh, oh yeah, can, can you? Oh, thanks. But you know, you can't say, "Well, Amazon is too authoritarian; they've got us by the balls because we all need food, and the only way to get food now is to get it delivered by Amazon." And you say, "Well." Yeah, you appointed them as an intermediary. You'll always have some intermediary that'll have some hold of you. That's that's where the power comes in. Once you outsource your protection, that's it. You um, once you outsource your your earnings, your protection, your every everything you outsource means that that person owns you. They're standing on your oxygen pipe, so you'll never be independent. You'll always be dependent. And it's a pipe dream to say, yeah, but we'll be mutually dependent and we'll all respect each other's oxygen. And you say, no, because you've got psychopaths and you're not prepared to kill them. So then we can't have a society. We can't have nice things while there are people like Donald Trump around. So it's like, in essence, you have to get rid of industrial society. And if, if people don't start monkey wrenching it soon, it's going to go away anyway. But you've got to be accelerationists because... There's not going to be much left unless we start getting rid of it and monkey wrenching it. So we need to get a, a, people that think the same way and start working against the system and basically educating to people, saying, look, it's going away anyway. But make it go away early. You're doing this people a favor. But it's hard, uh, hard to get through, but I believe you can get through with an R. Oh, hi. <laughs> hey, sorry. <laughs> It's interesting what you're just saying, actually, um, just a few 
paragraphs back about the techno utopian great reset rockefeller people um i've been getting a lot of i've been following a few people on the right um just you know through various channels who are obviously coming into this from the point of view of this is bad news you know for um people on the right um in terms of the lockdown restrictions of you know and I'm wondering if those people actually from the right, you know, might be uh, getting to the point where they're thinking they're going to need to monkey wrench it. There seems to be a lot more voices on the right, is what I'm saying, that are kind of agreeing with what you say. They despise any idea of some techno-utopia um, great reset because of, of course, all this green agenda, you know. And of course, that's always a left-right issue, isn't it, you know? So... Maybe there will be more people from, I'm not talking about the hard right necessarily, but yeah, from the right, I think, maybe. Mm. I don't know what you think, think about people, that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure, every, I'm not sure if it is biased more, um, you know, anti-tech is more left or right biased. I mean, if, if you look at like the definitive anti-tech guy who was ahead of all of us was Uncle Ted, which I'm sure you know who Uncle Ted was. I hesitate to say his name because you, if you say that on, on these things, basically, it's not conspiratorial to say that they're trigger words and his name is one of them. But they, they, the NSA and all these guys that are polling, they're, they're very, you can have a look at what words you, you use. And they're, they're basically this list of, of words that basically will, they will start, you know, bots will start tracking the conversation. But what I've often said to people is get the list of words and just have millions of conversations where you use those words. You've got to swamp these systems. That's the big weakness. You see, um, the big weakness of uh, of, these, of the surveillance state, it, it's too nosy, and they, they can't ha handle a deluge. You see, what I, what I suspect is happening right now at a time like this is the guys are completely overwhelmed. They've done all this tracking stuff and everything, but it's, it, basically it has to come at a certain pace. So at times like this, they're completely overwhelmed. They basically, they you know the FBI and stuff is running around like headless chickens now, because they they you know they just see networks everywhere. It's it's too fluid, and so basically they just all they they wind up doing is sending out these you know communiques to the capital, and you know the shit's going to come down, <laughs> and it's like well what shit who you know it's like everybody everywhere, <laughs> you know? and that's the big danger of these systems is it's basically. Uh, Binny warned them. Binny warned, uh, you know, if you know, I think Michael Binny, but he he was a defector from the system. But he 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 was a, a patriot. He was nationalist, and so, but he he warned uh, the NSA and stuff, and said like these systems are incredibly fragile because they they're going to get overloaded with data. They're going to get uh, data overloaded, and that that's always what happens to these guys. It's like the state is like a monster of of paranoia. And so if you, you're paranoid about everything, you're trying to, oh, we want more information. Everybody, every paranoid, thick, you know, psychopath at the top, they always want more information. Give me more information. Give me. And so all the little underlings run off and make these systems that get more. And eventually you get so much data that you're overwhelmed. And that's where it's basically selective. And they not, they have no salience of landscape. And eventually they just go, everybody's out there, the barbarians, horizon to horizon. So we, we must get the, the sheep to understand their numbers. So for example, like, just have a look at the, you know, all of this is bluff, right? If you go back and look at how authoritarians work, if you look at how the British Empire worked, it was basically a little kid with a revolver and a pith helmet um, subduing, like, 20,000 natives just by fear. <laughs> and basically, if if like 10 of them had said like, fuck off, dude, they would have, uh, that would have been the end of the British Empire. But they all keep it going with bluff and bluster and swagger. And that's how all authoritarians work. So if you take, for instance, this lockdown now in the capital, the 25,000 right? They just wiggled mostly. 
but the it's very very intimidating this the show of power it's actually a show of weakness if you they're, they're like four hundred and fifty thousand national guardsmen in in the u.s you think that's like half a million soldiers that's like you know most countries armies as just national guardsmen just to you know handle situations like this and then you know you think four hundred and fifty thousand. wow that's you know america's a police you know, armed camp say so, no four hundred and fifty thousand is less than one tenth of one percent of the british i mean the u.s population you can see how conflicted <laughs> but it's one tenth of one percent so the entire National Guard that needs to hold down an insurrection is one tenth of one percent of the entire American population. Basically, if everybody got rowdy, there'd be like 300 people per National Guardsman. They could just, you know, walk up and knock their helmet off and say, fuck off, dude. And the guys would be running faster than the guys in the Capitol. So they they put on this big show and they have all this, you know, locking lock in and show all the tanks rolling in and stuff. And it's all bluff. If the people said like, oh, we've had enough, you just walk through those guys. It's a complete, you see, one of the things that the capital is, it was an inside job. And that's why I was so upset last week, because I didn't realize that they'd infiltrated so badly. But the same uh, goes, you know, basically that the population has to be educated to say, look, look, we outnumber these, <laughs> the ants outnumber these locusts thousands to one. Yeah, it's just a question of intimidation. Well, it's I, just a question of fear. Exactly. I mean, this, this has happened so many times in history, and we're badly in need of uh, historians to come out and tell the the number of times throughout history where you know the people have risen up and you know stormed the ramparts, as it were. And you know, people were just. And this is what I'm saying about people. So there's a lot of people in the in the UK on the right of the argument. You know, conservatives who are saying, you know, look, we don't have to stand for this. This is in. This is okay. This is a bit of a side thing because it's not to do with America. Um, but anyway, I'm saying that yeah, there are people on the right of the side of the argument who say, look, no. If we all stood up and said no, we don't want this lockdown anymore. For example, then you know, what are they going to do? <laughs> you know. Well, this is where we completely ridden by um, ID poll and all these kind of liberal tropes that are now plaguing the left. Because I've tested this. I've, I've gone on to right-wing sites and stuff and, and just trolled them and stuff and said, you know, try to be provocative and say, you know, hey, you know, the horseshoe theory that the extreme left and the extreme right is the same, you know, should come on over to the extreme left. And on the on the extreme right, they'll go, yeah, you know, fuck, we got nothing against you. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, I don't like gay guys and stuff, but I'll live with it if you know you take tearing down the government. But the you know the, on the left, it's like, what they fucking Nazis? <laughs> you know, it's like I'm not, I you, you know, just utter blinds go up. And you say like, hang on a minute, let's just analyze this freaking Nazi trope for a minute. Uh, and you just start down this path and you just say, look, Hitler was actually a national socialist. And they all say, oh, name only. I say, no, he was a socialist. <laughs> the difference between an international socialist and a national socialist is huge. But it's still socialism. He implemented socialism in Germany at a national level. Completely different to international socialism, admittedly. But... You know, don't get your knickers in a twist about this left and right thing. They've done a great job of dividing us. And it's the left's problem. The right doesn't see this. The right doesn't like cancel culture. The right doesn't like this um, this uh, homogeneity. Homogene the, the right wants to keep it simple. But, the you know, compared to the fact that we, we have a common enemy, it's these oligarchs and their government. And, and so we have to basically start that. And, and we have to start a culture of shut up with your ID poll. Your, your fucking identity doesn't matter to me. In fact, I find it repulsive that you have your little identity that you groom. Right? It makes me sick. So I was saying, like, get over your fucking identity and start talking to people on the right. Yeah, the, I, feel, I feel like the left has forgotten its project in general. Uh, the, I feel like the left 
was originally supposed to be uh, people for the commons against the government and capital. That's what the left is supposed to be doing. And I'm pretty sure even the right could get behind that. Yeah, the left is supposed to be for the workers. And it's like, there are no workers now. Everybody's a white collar worker and they, they're liberals that shop at Walmart. It's like, there's nothing left about this. You just, everyone's just a freaking capitalist with some fucking t-shirt, different t-shirts. But uh, so I think our biggest fight is against identity politics and this. You have to basically say, we're on your side and you got to fucking jack up. So I'm in some ways, I'm like, if, if we get through to the 21st without a coup, I'm hugely relieved because basically fucking hell. I mean, a Trump tyranny would be a fucking disaster. But, but I'm also a little bit upset because the, the left has learned nothing. If, if, we, if we make it through without a coup, we'll be fucking lucky. And the left hasn't learned anything. They still believe in all these institutions. They're still gloating and crowing and, you know, indulging themselves in this ugly way. And it's like, it's like you know, you just wake up, man. It's basically you got to, you got to, you've got to change. The left has to change. But they're all about, you know, the world has to change and all this. No, the left has to change first. Um, you know, basically, so... Yeah, that's why I feel about it. It's as if the left has fallen into the distraction of, um, yeah, identity, me, me first. Um, so it's kind of hard to, to for, for everyone to see that, as you say, there is a common enemy and um, it's all the propaganda too of the mass media that um, em emphasizes hate and um, divisiveness. So it seems like it's a, really a concerted effort that's intentional to divide us. It's probably one of the oldest strategies, divide and conquer. I think it's in your video that you posted a long time ago on your, and you had in your videos, you of Adam Curtis. I think it it's it's also relates to that, you know, the the century of the self, the the machine of consuming, and you know that all this is a is a very well oiled system now that's completely permeated uh, the right and the left, and the left even more, because it has appealed to to people with enormous egos. And so. Um, yeah, it's that that's the fate of the left. Um, it resumed in all those, all those uh, theories. I think you know. It, it was Eddie Bernays. Eddie Eddie Bernays and a few of these architects. They they deliberately. People don't realize how cunning and deliberate this all was. Because then again, oh, conspiracy theories. It's like no, it wasn't a conspiracy theory. <laughs> just just anything that makes you feel bad. In, in the liberal left, anything that makes you feel bad is toxic and a conspiracy theory and go away. And it's like, you know, I want, I would like the, the world in a way to get bad just so that they would have to get over that. Basically, you know, if, if you don't get over this fucking sugar addiction, uh, we, we're in such deep trouble. But it's, it's basically you're trading sugar for, for pain and misery later. So that, that, it makes my skin crawl because I feel like I know where they're headed. And so basically they, uh, you know, they, you know, they, they should be making hay is the thing, but the kind of sugar addiction now is, is being paid for with the debt of pain afterwards. And so every, every time they say like, don't make my feelings bad, it's say like, look, I can make your feelings good, but it runs at a deficit. They think it's all for free. They get to feel good all the time for free. Say, no, every time you feel good now is a debt that has to be paid for with pain later. I don't think people have that concept. But, what, yeah, well, does anybody understand what I'm saying? Well, yes, and I, I ties to something you said about the lockdowns earlier. Don't go away. <laughs> you said something about the lockdowns, and I was in, intrigued because um, I... I I, I haven't debated this much about only the acceptance, the usefulness, 
the timing of all these lockdowns around the world. I don't know how they are mm. in America, but us, uh, you're in the UK, aren't you? And I'm in, in Ireland. Yeah. We have very strict ones. And I, I traveled to a couple of countries a while ago, recently and I saw what it can be to be policed and, and, and punished for breaking lockdowns. So um, what, what, is the, what, is your, what was your point when you were talking about uh, the lockdowns earlier? I think I was getting at what a lot of people on the right are saying now is that this is part of a greater um, strategy um, by these people like uh, Klaus Schwab, at the um, World Economic Forum, um, the Great Reset. It's all there. It's all public. Um, so this is why it's funny now, because there's all these main, fairly mainstream journalists uh, on the right of the argument, like who write in The Spectator, like James Dellingpole and uh, who else? Um, quite quite a few anyway. But th they are saying, like, clearly, this is like, you know, out in the open. And when there's a crisis like there conveniently was with the pandemic, um, they've yeah started you know it's 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 convenient to have everyone locked up i suppose there's also the other argument of like the long march through the institutions um the, the left that agenda um i would probably say as well what's that what's that the, the antonio grouchy the long march you know um the com uh, the sort of left takeover of the cultural institutions within the uk and arguably in the west as a whole um, which kind of ties into the argument of like, why is the left now? It's all just like Gen Z, isn't it? And why like identity politics? And they've they've already kind of won in that respect. The the the, the left, the, the communists, as it were, in terms of like breaking the um, the West, um, you know, destroying the family. Okay, Jordan um, Peterson's argument, right? Jordan Peterson as well, right? Argument. Uh, yeah, does he say that? I'm not sure. I haven't seen any Jordan Peterson of late. I, yeah, maybe. But anyway, I think I was just making the point about the lockdowns. Um, that plays in very easily to the the elite. The the it's good. we're heading to neo feudalism, aren't we? You know, and they they're quite happy to have us all locked up and, as Hugh was saying earlier, um, reliant on Amazon and uh, all these uh, corporations, and it's. It's breaking people down, yeah. But I, I suppose there's, there's two strands to the argument there. I'm not sure what you were referring to, Sophie, but, but yeah. Well, I, I was interested to know what was the position of people in the group on, on the response to, to the COVID crisis around the world and different positions, because I, I'm perplexed also. I can see as a doctor, I can see a point in, in not mixing when, because <laughs> I mean, this winter, nobody has got a cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because people are washing their hands they're not going yeah. to visit old people so do you know what i mean there's all sorts of uh, plenty of uh, of sides to the but the, the way the lockdowns are enforced the, the the agenda behind it all that is open to debate and i'm interested in hearing what you have to say well yeah. it's, it's a trade-off right and uh, we, yeah. we're not allowed to discuss the trade-off that's that's what worries me yeah I think there's a bigger thing at work. I mean, the, yeah, the pandemic, yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, COVID is a nasty disease if you get it, but uh, I still think they're overplaying it. Here in the UK, the BBC propaganda is going off the scale now. It is, it's incredible, and it's become politicised. It has already. It's you can tell um, the majority. So, well, according to the polling, which of course we know is bogus. They reckon most people are now in favour of even stricter lockdowns. Um, but it's, and they're even talking, they're joking on mainstream media about paying people to snitch on people for breaking lockdown rules. It's crazy. It's getting weird, very weird. It, quickly. It, it's the um, very old tactic of divide and conquer. That's why I don't like these uh, identity politics. It's completely fucked over the left with divide and conquer. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's already happening on the continent that people are that there's dilation and people are are calling police if somebody is just not you know not respecting lockdown. It's it's that that is just rampant in Europe. I don't know how. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's straight out of 1984. Yeah. That's uh, I. I 
it, it sent a chill down. I just saw this article today. It sent a chill down my spine. Is that that they were the FBI is getting kids to rat out the parents who were at the insurrection? Really? Oh, jeez. Yeah. yeah, because they know there's a generational divide, and so basically, yeah, this this one woman was was caught because her daughter ratted her out. And the, the the FBI encouraging it. It's just it's just that is one of the the vignettes in 1984, if you remember it. The kid ratting out the parents. The the state using kids to rat out their parents. The Stasi did it in East Germany. That that's the worst thing you can do is to divide a generation, you know, by politics, exploit it. That that that's something I agree with the right one is the destruction of the family. But that that destruction. I mean, I, the nuclear family is an abomination. But if, if you if you if you you if you destroy filial loyalties at that level by by ratting people out, it's just we're done. We're done. Auschwitz comes next. You see what? The, one of the they so we need to have hard conversations and stop the Zionist bullshit about what happened in those death camps. And one of the things that happened in the death camps is is the all the taboo subjects that you're not allowed to talk about like why wasn't there any resistance and then oh yes there was resistance and we'll make up a new history where there was you know fabricated resistance this kind of thing well one of the re the reasons why they were able to do the genocide in Auschwitz is because they they got people to work against each other they got everybody into a rat race where everybody was individualist working together but if they had solidarity the guys again there were so many millions in those camps they could have walked out they didn't have the guards to keep them in if they'd resisted but they set things up so that everybody ratted everybody else everybody was was in, in competition against each other and that's one of the ways you can do these managed extinctions right, is, and genocides is to get p individuals to work against each other and appear you can get the the young to work against the old any any little division you can find you just stick a wedge in it the state sticks a wedge in it. And we're seeing it done now. Yeah, I, I remember that from uh, 1984 as well. Like, uh, especially that part where, like, O'Brien is, like, talking to Winston about how the state keeps the oligarchy in power, like, destroying, like, love and the sex instinct and all that. That's just horrible shit. Yeah, it, it's, again, it's the intermediaries. They destroy any bonds between humans. And replace them. The state intervenes and says, I, "You know, I'm an intermediary, an intermediary between sex and love and religion and food and everything." It's basically the, the the state can reinforce itself by making sure that it's an indispensable intermediary. It's basically it's just weaning yourself off the teat. But unfortunately, that's why why I said it's a it's a gender divide because. It's, it has a lot to do with domestication and dependence. It's kind of like the, there is this element of the mammalian brain that basically the mother that can't let, you know, cut the umbilical cord and let the children be free. So you have this kind of unholy alliance with this kind of feminist thing, which is kind of like, oh, I must look after the little chicks. So everybody thinks that's all nice because it's motherhood and apple pie and it's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and it's basically the New Zealand Prime Minister and it's nice because it's mom and apple pie and it's saying yeah it's also the fucking worst form of authoritarianism that you can believe it basically everybody in New Zealand is kind of dependent on this mother figure that that's not a good place to be <laughs> at all basically the, the the more sheep that are standing on two legs in New Zealand on than on four Yeah, I think it's going to be a uh, tough, a tough reckoning for people that aren't realizing this stuff in liberals. It's like the I feel like the whole industrial system is doing like Hitler's guns and butter policy against the entire planet right now. Yeah. But what is the situation of lockdowns in the U.S. at the moment? Is there any lockdowns? Is there any, what? What is it? Is it uh, in front I, of the state? I, I don't know exactly um, what the I I think it's not like I don't think it's locked down. I think people are doing their social distancing. Yeah, um, I'm kind of far away from the action in, in that regard. I like clean a school at night, so I'm like away from the marketplace and all that stuff, and away from crowds. 
so I kind of talk, try to talk to people and see what's going on. But as far as I know, uh, no major lockdown. It's just social distancing right now. Yeah, it's all done by state. So, like my my kids are in Washington, and then they the colleges are closed, so they're doing you know classes online. But the the shops are open. Everything's open. Nobody wears a mask. It's just basically everybody's going around doing the the business in in most states. I don't think there are any states that are seriously locked down. Um, you have to wear a mask. If you don't, uh, it's kind of like a statement. Um, but uh, you wouldn't. I mean, considering here I'm in Greece, and uh, basically they're handing out. Two thousand dollar fines <laughs> on the street, spot fines of two thousand dollars, and these guys are are losing their restaurants. They're being shut it up, and they're being, you know, fined five grand and stuff for you know having letting people through the door. And, and so, uh, but it's it sounds very authoritarian, but it's not as bad as you think. It's basically because the people 